Yeah, uh, just a little bit about my testimony. I was born 16 days before the invasion, and you know, God definitely rescued uh, my family from all that, even though I had no idea of anything about it. You know, even though I grew, grew up and I was brought up in a Christian household, there was a time where I was influenced by my peers to do things that like, I'm not entirely proud of, but it got me on the route of uh, mistaking my identity for something else. I had gone through depression and things like that. And uh, even though I was walking with the Lord and I was going to church every day, like, I still felt like I was a black sheep of you know, the church uh, because of the way that I felt like everyone looked at me. And so I had gone through depression and things like that. And, and then, you know, uh, and even though I was like walking with God, I kind of had one foot in the church, one foot sort of in the world. Um, and then after college, I kind of dove a little bit deeper into the world. And um, it took six of my friends getting murdered in a span of two years for me to turn my life around. Uh, and God showed me, asking me out of uh, my friend's memorial service, what my life was worth. And, uh, and I realized, it came to the realization that my life was worth more than this, and that I had so much more to life than this. And I, uh, I had this radical encounter with God February 10, 2010. The things that I experienced during that time of fasting there's no way that anyone can tell me that there's no such thing as God or that the power of the Holy Spirit is not for today and that he revealed his, like, my identity and actually brought out my book today. The original glory of man, you can actually purchase it on Amazon or any bookstore. That's called the original glory of man. And the reason why I called it the original glory of man is because of our identity. And so if uh, you, if you guys can turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, uh, Let's make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The word image in the Hebrew text, the only time that word is ever used in the Old Testament is when it's referring to idols. And the word likeness, the actual word for it is counterpart. And the, and the definition of a counterpart is someone who's exactly like it has the same function as the other person. That in itself shows how we were created. And I was, as I was studying, um, I felt like the Lord was showing me was that, you know, when God was creating, you know, everything, he was creating a prototype and an archetype. So a prototype is the original and the archetype is the exact copy of the original. And it was created to, for the original to merge into the archetype. And you see that when everything in creation is being made. And you see the prototype and archetype of every creature. But then when man is created, you see that it's only man that's created. But then you come to realize when you read this verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God is the prototype and man is the archetype. And that in itself is just so overwhelming that God created like us for himself. So when, uh, you know, like to understand like what, like why were we created, we have to understand who God is. Um, and to understand that it says, you know, first John 4, 8, that God is love and that, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 8, it says, you know, when you stand before the throne of God, everything that you do on earth, on earth is going to be set on fire, and the things that remain, you're going to receive your reward according to that. Now, the question is, how do we know what's going to remain? We see that in, uh, I believe it's Hebrews chapter 12, where it says that God is a holy, consuming fire. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, um, it says, you know, if I were to speak with tongues of angels, if I were to give my body to the fire, if I do all of these things, but I don't have love, it's going to profit absolutely nothing. And that's to show that ultimately that everything that we do has to be through the love of God. Matthew chapter 5, where we talk, where Jesus talks about the Beatitudes, 
Now bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Things like that. It says how we're supposed to, you know, walk according to what Jesus said. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. It says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. I know I'm jumping out of scriptures, but I'm getting to a point. Proverbs 18, 21 says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And the reason for it is in Genesis chapter 2, I believe it's verse 7, where it says that God breathed the breath of life into man. Uh, when God breathed the breath of life into man, in the Hebrew text, it actually says that he breathed the Ruach HaKadosh. The Ruach HaKadosh is the Holy Spirit of God. So every single time we're breathing in and out, we're breathing in and out the Holy Spirit of God. Every single time we're breathing in and out, not only are we breathing in and out the Holy Spirit of God, but uh, it's scientifically proven that you cannot speak without breathing. So every single time you're speaking, you're also breathing, which means that um, every word that you speak is being carried out into existence by the Holy Spirit of God. But even deeper than that is the, the fact that like, the way that sound in itself is created is when uh, your the breath in your lungs um, hits your vocal cords. It creates the words that come out, the sound and the words that come out of your mouth. So it is through the Holy Spirit's power in itself that creates the words that come out of your mouth. And that is why your words are so powerful. And um, in recent studies that scientists have done, they used sound waves and pinpointed at a, and did a test on a fish and they pinpointed at the fish, fish's DNA and it changed the DNA of the fish. That shows the power of sound, that shows the power of our words. And then, so to understand that and to go back to Genesis chapter one, and then you go to verse 28. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So uh, when it says, uh, and fill the earth and subdue it, if you were to read that in the Hebrew text, the word fill the earth, it literally means to consecrate the earth. Why do we need to consecrate the earth? Because according to Hebrews chapter 12, it says that God is a holy consuming fire. Because he is a holy consuming fire, and we see that example in 1 Corinthians 3, that anything before the Lord that is not of him is going to be turned to a crisp. So we have to consecrate the earth. That was the role of man to consecrate the earth. And the reason why we had to consecrate the earth was so that God can come and walk in fellowship with man. And his whole purpose for humanity was to just to be loved by him. And I was led by our Holy Spirit to go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, And God created the heavens and the earth. If I don't know if you guys know this, but in the Hebrew language is very fascinating. Because in the Hebrew language, every letter represents a picture, a word, number, and a spiritual meaning. For example, the name Yahweh is yod He vav He. The picture for Yahweh is behold a hand, behold a nail. That in itself represents Jesus. Like how fascinating is that? You know, in Genesis chapter 5, uh, when you see the genealogy from Adam to Noah, and you put the names chronologically side by side, you replace each name with the definition of each name, you get a paraphrased version of John 3.16. How fascinating is that that God used these letters to have these the spiritual meanings. Um, and so knowing that, I decided to dissect Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and, and I really felt like there was something about the word earth. Many times in scripture, it talks about going into the secret place with God, because that's where you have intimacy with the Lord, and you have that personal relationship between you and the Lord. <clears throat> well, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and look at the word um, earth, the Hebrew word is eretz. Uh, the spiritual definition for the word earth is the place where the higher and lower worlds are connected through the creation of something from nothing as a house that contains infinite and exponential growth with transition flow and change of life to explore the secrets of the creator through spiritual DNA with the essence of the creator 
who animates all matter, guides and dwells within. That is the definition for the word earth. So if you really look at the word earth, it is showing that God created the earth as a place, as his own secret place. Because God is love and he is the essence of what love is. He created humanity just to be loved by God. And that is our identity. Our identity, that is why Jesus was so radically wanting to save us. He was risking everything to be able to save us. He created us for himself. I mean, he didn't create us for just to worship him. He has billions of angels to do that. If you really look at it, he has billions of angels in heaven that are constantly worshiping him. He has the four living creatures surrounding his throne and has the 24 elders constantly worshiping him, God at his side. So why create us? Like He already has that. But God being love, that is who he is. He created us. And if you really dive in and understand this, like God created the earth as a place for himself to be in. That is what the word earth means. Uh, God created a place at, uh, for him to, himself to be in, and he created humanity to be like him in, in every shape and form. And that's why even Jesus, when he was tried by Pilate, he was like, are we not all gods with a small g? So in a way, God, God created us to be like him on the earth. We were created to rule and reign on this earth, and we were created to you know, consecrate this place so that the creator of all, everything can come down and fellowship with the ones that he created for himself. And when the enemy took that away from him, in that very moment, he made that way. And, and you see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it says that um, like he shall bruise his uh, heel and uh, his uh, Foot shall break is uh, the snake's neck. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that's and that is the very first uh, depiction of the gospel. It is vital in our walk with God because it's not just about doing works. It's not you know like I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. Stop being. Hey, we have to stop being like Martha and be like Mary and sit at the feet of Jesus because that's all He wants. He wants fellowship. He wants. He wants to love on you. And it's coming to that understanding. Just being you pleases him. Just being who you are in the middle of where you are pleases him. You know, I, and I just want to encourage you guys uh, that are watching. Don't think that you have to do these things just to be pleased and loved by God. Because it is that's not how God works. It's through the relationship that you have with him and it's through getting to know him that you can even change um and there's this story and uh, analogy that i've heard many times and i believe that it's very uh, important to understand you know like when you're when you're very sick you don't try to get better and then you go to the hospital uh, to get your medication and, you know, get, you know, go to the doctor and things like that. No, you, when you're sick or, or when you have a broken bone, you go to the doctor and you get things like that. In the same way, we're all, all of, to a point, spiritually broken people. We can't try to fix ourselves and then go to Jesus. No, we go to Jesus to get fixed and we go to Jesus and, and his love is what transforms us. And I was reading this book where um, the author, he gave such a perfect analogy. And, and it's another one that I think that, um, uh, that we can all relate to. And sometimes we see us on one side and then we see all of our junk right here. And we see Jesus on the other side. And we think that uh, we have to get through all of this junk in order to get to Jesus. But the reality is you're here and Jesus is right here next to you. And Jesus is saying, come on, let's get through this together. 
Let's get through this together. And it is through that one-on-one relationship with him that, you know, our lives can be transformed. And even uh, just a a testimony of, you know, my own personal life, Mm -hmm. like as I was growing up and and I grew up in the word and things like that, but even when I fell away, uh, even the times that, you know, I, I fell into sin and things like that, I was still standing on God's word to deliver me. And I was trying to get to that relationship and I was trying to, and it was through like really hungering after God that I was even delivered from the struggles and addictions that I have, I was going through at the time. It's kind of taboo sometimes to talk about these things, but I believe that especially in today's generation, it's very vital um, to talk about these things because with the media and how things are nowadays, it's such an easy access for the younger generation to be influenced by it. And, and it's very important that, you know, we teach our, um, especially the younger generation, that going into that relationship with God, no matter what, because that's the only way to overcome it. I'm, I'm sharing all these things because I feel like it's important that we understand the fact that our relationship with God is very vital. Um, and also, when it comes to speaking life over ourselves and over every situation, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And one example is a couple months ago, I think it was back in January, both my parents had tested positive for COVID. And, you know, me being around them, I was having an argument with my brother and he was like, Justin, you have, um, you're also tested positive for COVID because dad and mom um, are positive for COVID and they're sick. So you're around them, that means you're sick too. And I was like, no, I refuse to believe that. And I started speaking life over myself and I started saying that um, I don't carry death in my life. I don't carry a virus that brings death. I, br- I, ha- I carry the one who brings life and life more abundantly. I bring carry the Holy Spirit in me, who is the giver of life. And I started declaring these things. And he thought I and he thought I was crazy for saying the things that I did. And he even made a bet with me. And he was like, all right, go get tested tomorrow. Uh, and watch, you're going to get tested positive. And I said, no, I refuse to believe that. And I started, and I had been speaking life over myself. Um, and, you know, I, I had been, and it's been at least a week since that our mom had been positive. Uh, and then I, when I went to go get tested and then I got the results back and it said that I was negative, but, you know, that's just to show like, the importance and the influence of our words to keep going from that. If we can read, uh, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the scriptures are the very words that God put into writing. And when we declare what the scriptures say, we are speaking out the very words that came out of the mouth of the creator. And the word doesn't come back to God void, but accomplishes exactly what he pleases. Uh, And and what we have to understand is that the words that came from the mouth of God were brought everything to life. And that, and those, those very words are in the book that we read it. And the word of God is so powerful that like when we speak it, the the words that we speak come into existence in our lives. And that's what, and if we go to, I think it was first Samuel uh, where Samuel tells the Lord, let, let not my words fall to the ground empty, which he's saying that um, every word that he would speak would come into existence. And it, the, and there's such an importance in, in the words that we speak, especially over ourselves. And that's why Jesus constantly talked about in the Beatitudes to bless and not curse. And when you're blessing people, you're walking in love. And it is through um, walking in love that we emanate who God is and uh, emanate our identity. And in order to understand like who, like our identity in that, 
like we have to really understand who God is and and how God is love. Where uh, and and we see the definition of what love is in First Corinthians at the thirteen, and we and it's called the love chapter, and it says love suffers long, love is kind, love does not envy, uh, love does not parade itself, love is not puffed up, and love doesn't behave rudely, love does not seek its own, love is not provoked, love thinks no evil, love does not rejoice in iniquity, love. Rejoices in the truth and bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and it never fails. Uh, and I did a detailed study in the Greek of uh, what each of those mean. And it's that love, it doesn't lose heart. Love is virtuous and concerned with the principles of uh, right and wrong. And conforming to the standards of the behavior and characteristics based on principles, uh, love doesn't envy, which means that it, it, it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't covet regarding the uh, advantages of other people and uh, in regards to possessions and things like that. Uh, and love doesn't parade itself or boast even to exaggeration. Love is not uh, puffed up, which means to, like it doesn't act in the flesh. And love doesn't seek its own. It doesn't crave something from someone else for themselves. And love is not provoked, which is that it's not anger. Love thinks no evil. Uh, love does not rejoice in iniquity. And it's really talking about love doesn't deal with fraudulently or deceitfully with others. It rejoices in the truth. Uh, it bears all things. And that means to protect by covering all protects by covering all things and and something that the lord showed me was that what love really does is that when you see you know someone our job as their brothers and sisters in the lord is to cover them in love and really to protect them from wh whether it's by other uh brothers and sisters in christ or even the world and and i believe that you know in today's age we do that many times with a lot of preachers and i understand that like there are some preachers that many don't like and uh many times we you know publicly humiliate them because we don't believe that they're speaking or what i would say our version of the truth the way that i look at it is that we're all part of the same body but you know the heart cannot tell the finger uh, oh you're doing this wrong because, you know, the finger's job in the body is different from the job of the heart in the body. So whatever that person is called to do, they're doing it a certain way. And and you see the fruit of their labor. Um, and so, and even then, like, so being human, we sometimes mess up. And because of that, and especially when you become, people publicly start hating you. And our job as, you know, their brothers and sisters we're supposed to be covering them in love and not, you know, putting them out to the wolves. Uh, and and I see that more often than not. And for me personally, um, there's one thing that I always look back on, and it and it's the story of David and Saul, where David was was hiding in the cave with his men, and King Saul came in and rested. And David's men were like, told him, "Look, here's Saul." Here's your opportunity to kill him. David says to them, I will not harm the Lord's anointed. And later on, you see that he cuts off a piece of his robe and, you know, uh, took his spear. And even then he repented from that. And the thing is that even though the spirit of God had left King Saul, the anointing of Saul's kingship was there. And the anointing will never leave. And so because of that anointing, David chose not to harm him. And even when he ripped off a tiny piece of his robe, he felt so guilty from that and he repented. So in my own personal view, like when it comes to specific, you know, big name preachers and things like that, I, I refuse to harm the Lord's anointed because they were anointed by the Lord to do the work of the ministry at one point. Now, whether that they're in walking the right path or not 
that's still not my call because you know the scripture tells us you know uh, pluck out the don't pluck out the plank in that person's eye when you have a plank in your own so you got to focus on the plank in your eye first before you do that so i have my own personal things that i have to you know worry about and i'm working my own salvation with fear and trembling and i'm not going to do that with them so like out of love I I personally choose not to, you know, attack them or, you know, put them down. But instead, I and I, I'm choosing to just love on them and pray. Like, if I see that they're messing up, I'm just going to pray and ask the Lord to bring people into their lives to put them on the track that they're, go, they're supposed to go through, um, that you're calling them into. And if I am in the wrong for thinking a certain way, I ask the Lord to change my perspective and show me the way that I think about that is incorrect. Um, and we, we know these big name preachers, like there's Joel Osteen and all these other people. And personally for me, I, I will never, I, I choose not to, you know, bash them because they are sons and, and, you know, daughters of the living God. And they are part of the body. So because of that, I am not going to do it. And, you know, if they're messing up, then that's between them and the Lord. And there are, there have been times when some of their own sermons, God really moved and spoke to me. So, and, and you see their congregation and you see that they're, because I have one of my close friends who got saved at a Joel Osteen meeting, which I was actually shocked about, you know, and that really convicted me. And, and I used to dislike Hillsong, and especially Hillsong, New York. And I went to Hillsong, New York a couple years ago, and God really convicted me because of the sermon, uh, the message that um, God spoke through the pastor of that church. And it really, like, opened my mind because I came to the realization that these are God's people, these are God's children, these are anointed by God himself you know, to do the work of the ministry. Who am I to say they're a false prophet? Who am I to say, you know, if, if they are, then I pray that, you know, God convicts them. And, and if they are doing wrong and if they are leading people incorrectly, then God himself is going to deal with that, which he did with specific leaders in the church. Uh, I, ha I have personally seen like several leaders, uh, big name uh, people, um, that I've personally met, and I have not seen anything wrong in what God is calling them into. I would like to share a story. Back in 2013 or 2014, I started going to school again because I was doing an internship at my old church. Not, I was the only practicing Christian. The thing is that my group of friends only knew of Christianity as something that was, you know, shoved down people's throats or condemning people to hell. And at this time, God was revealing to me his heart as a father and um, and really studying the Beatitudes and understanding what it was to walk in love. I was at this point in my life where I got tired of seeing all the hate and I just, I was like, Lord, let me just be love for you. Let me be love for you to these people. And among my group of friends, I was the only Christian. I had friends who were Satanists, Wiccan. Uh, Buddhist, Muslim, non-practicing Roman Catholics, among many others, and, you know, Satanists and Wiccans who practice witchcraft. Throughout the, this time with this group of friends, not once did I ever talk about Jesus, but they knew that I was a Christian. And whenever I would hang out with them, they knew that I was the person that they could go to for anything, for help, for advice, for like any arguments that they were having that they needed to be resolved. Every single one of my friends knew that they could come to me for anything. They knew a little bit of my story. Actually, they knew more, but more detail. And, um, and I remember one day we were just sitting in a circle and we were just talking. And one of my friends who was a, um, an atheist who was a lesbian publicly puts me on the spot in front of all my friends and says, Justin, I've heard your story, yet with everything that you've gone through, 
<laughs> she was like, I, I don't understand how it is you're living the way that you are and you're so vibrant, you're so joyful. Like, what is it that you have? Because whatever it is that you have, I want what you have. Every single person chimed in and they all agreed with her in, in that moment. I felt very humble. Be and I was like trying my best not to cry because I, I was, you know, really trying to be like Jesus to my friends without even having to preach the gospel. I was just trying to be love in itself the way that I was studying, you know, first Corinthians 13 and, you know, Matthew chapter five through seven, all of that. I was literally trying to be love the way that God was showing me and I was finally doing it. And then my friend was a, uh, was a lesbian and atheist later on comes to know the Lord. She accepts Jesus into her life and she stopped her gay lifestyle. My Wiccan friend is no longer a Wiccan. She received Jesus into her life. Uh, and, and she was, she used to be a meth addict and that she's, she's completely clean. She's married with three children now. And then my Satanist friend, all of these friends, they've all committed their lives to the Lord because I chose to walk in love with them. And you know, the world has seen us preach the gospel so many times, but they've never seen us walk in love. And I just want to encourage every single one of you, because our identity is love in itself. And that, that's the whole point of this whole message, is to really walk in the love of God. You know, um, every day when I walk down the street, like especially going to work, I work in downtown L.A. Uh, for the Superior Court of California. And there's homeless people everywhere. And and I'm walking by a homeless guy and shooting up, uh, like, um, you know, meth into his veins. And, like, my heart is breaking for these people. And, you know, uh, once a month or once a week, depending on certain things that are going on, uh, I go and volunteer with the churches that I'm associated with to feed them and minister to them and just love on them. And some of these people, have never, even though they're living in, LA, they've never heard the name of Jesus. You know, when I was, uh, last time I was there, I come across this lady and God just gave me a word of knowledge for her. And I started praying over her and prophesying over her. And all of a sudden she gets baptized by the Holy Spirit. And she starts praying, you know, praying in tongues and she accepts Jesus into her life. And, and she couldn't stop dancing and she couldn't even stop laughing either. And then right after that, uh, we bump into another homeless man who was praying and asking the Lord, like, Lord, bring someone uh, to me because I'm hungry. Literally 30 seconds after you prayed that, he bumped into us and we gave him food. And we get and one of my friends was wearing his jeans and he had a blanket. So he took his jeans off and gave it to the homeless man for him to have jeans. And then that day I had given away my jacket and my shoes. To this day, I've given away at least four pairs of my shoes. Uh, Los Angeles, there's a place called Skid Row, and I hate calling it Skid Row, you know. And I was like, no, if we're if we're calling it Skid Row, that's what we're calling. That's what we're speaking to existence. I was like, no, I'm calling this place Glory Row from now on because I want the glory of God to be, you know, in this place where the homeless. And I'm not even going to call them homeless anymore. I'm calling them my neighbors who live in tents. You know, because they are my neighbors. They are my neighbor who I'm supposed to show love to. You know, and that is one of the greatest commandments is to love. You know, Jesus says the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Second is like it to uh, love your neighbor as yourself. The only way to love your neighbor, how can, even, like, how can you love your neighbor if you, if you are not able to love yourself? And that is one thing that many people have a hard time doing is loving yourself. And in order to love yourself, you have to understand your identity. You need to understand the love that God has for you. He loves you so much that he gave himself. He would rather go to hell for you than to be in heaven without you for all of eternity. He risked himself to be in um in hell just so that you can be with him. And that's how much he loves you. Like the, from the moment of the fall of man, that moment, that very moment, he created the plan to 
redeem you to himself, okay. to love you to, to himself, you know, and, and it's just when you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, when you learn to, when you understand his love for you, then only can you, comp- and when you even try to comprehend it, you learn to love God in that same way. And when it's filled in you, then you're able to love your neighbor as yourself. That that is so that just by that um, law in itself, that's all you ever need to live by is to love, because it is only through the relationship between you and the Lord that anything can ever happen, and that is what we have to understand. And and I've come into that realization on the love of God, and I would encourage every single one of you to uh, spend time in your secret place. And that is whether that's in your car or whether, um, uh, you know, your lunch break at work or whatever, whatever time that is, uh, you know, spend that time with the Lord. And, um, and I was uh, listening to one of my pastors speak the other day and he, he said, it's time to stop praying the wimpy prayers. You know, stop then it's time to pray for the dangerous prayers. You know, the, the prayers that takes a lot of faith to, you know, for it to happen. You know, and even to pray things like, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. And even have that conversation with the Lord. Lord how are you doing today? Show me who, who um, your heart is broken for today so that you can use me as your vessel to minister your love to you know, when you go about your street, even the smallest gesture of a smile can do so much. You know, many years ago, I used to uh, do something called the free hugs campaign with my friends. Um, and I went to the mall and I held up a giant sign that said free hugs. And I gave hundreds of hugs that day. And then um, I remember the next week, I went to the mall to hang out with my friends and this random guy comes up to me and cries he's like thank you so much and i have no idea who this man is and i was like what are you talking about he's like well the hug that you gave me last week you changed my mind about committing suicide so i really want to encourage you um to ask the lord even to do the smallest gesture because in everything that you do you're representing the kingdom um, and really to be love to the least of these, to be love to every single person that you come across. Um, and e- even if, like, it's too, like, that crazy homeless person or um, the one who's schizophrenic, you know, uh, walking down the street, just love on them. And sometimes it can be scary. But, of course, you know, in everything, you have to always put the blood of Jesus over yourself and just ask to be used by him and and just keep declaring the word over yourself. And whenever I go anywhere, I always tell the Lord, you know, uh, I thank you, Lord, that, you know, every place the feet of my feet tread upon, I claim it for your kingdom, Lord. And, and, and I thank you, Lord, that uh, wherever I go, that, that you cover me with your blood, you cover my mind with your blood, you cover my eyes with your blood, you cover my ears, my nose, my uh, mouth, my heart, my hands, and my feet with your blood. And and I always pray that, that Lord, you show me who you want, uh, uh, who you are, who uh, is highlighted to you. And and I pray to the Lord to expand the capacity for me to understand more of who he is and i always and i also pray that like for me like uh lord um to um expand my senses to sense more of uh, the spirit and uh and and also for my ears to hear clearly from him and that my mouth would speak his words and his words alone that every word that comes out of my mouth uh does not fall to the ground empty and it will accomplish exactly what pleases the lord and it won't and it, and it will do exactly what he pleases and um and that everything that my hands touch 
will be blessed by the Lord and everything that my hands touch will be used for the kingdom. And these are the things that I pray on a daily basis. Um, and I would just encourage every single one of you to have that time with the Lord and really dig deep into understanding, you know, who you are and who you were created to. be. And each and every single one of you have a special gift, you know, and, you know, in the parable of the talents where there's the, the servant was one servant was given five talents. Another servant was given two talents and another servant was given one talent. Uh, and then after they, um, uh, did things with those talents, you know, uh, uh, the master came and rewarded them accordingly. And I and uh, during my time with the Lord, I felt like the Lord was showing me that it's not just talking about the money matters, but it was literally the talents and gifts that each and every single one of us have. So I would encourage every single one of you um, to spend time and ask the Lord how you can use the gifts and abilities, whether they're the natural gifts or the spiritual gifts, because both are important. Um, and how you can use them to glorify the kingdom. For me, I'm an artist. Uh, and I also um, uh, get prophetic words. And so many times whenever I get visions or dreams, I um, start creating artwork according to the visions and dreams that I have gotten. And, and I have actually tried to sell my artwork, but then what ends up happening is while I'm ministering to somebody, God tells me to give my artwork away to that person. And all of a sudden, they get healed from the artwork that I gave them. A couple of years ago, uh, when I had painted this eye, and it shows that, you know, you're the apple of God's eye. And then it shows, like, um, the emotions of God through the eye. And and so I was ministering to this young man. And, and I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me to give him one of my paintings. And so I asked him to come to my car. And I didn't, uh, even up until that point, I didn't know what I was supposed to give him. And I reached for that specific painting and I gave it to him. And he was like, how did you know? And I was like, I'm only giving you what God told me to give you. And then that's when he tells me that he's been having problems with his eyesight for several months. So right there and then I prayed over him and he gets healed on the spot. And that's just one of many examples because I chose to, you know, use the gifts and talents and abilities both natural and supernatural um, to be used by God. And in, and as I'm using it, God is going to take that and he's going to multiply it. Um, and now I have recently published a book. So for me, that's, that's another big step. And uh, in a couple of months, I'm going to be on a television network promoting my book. So that's another big step. And, um, and, and, so I just want to encourage every single one of you to um, really ask the Lord how you can use the gifts and talents and abilities that you have to glorify the kingdom, whether it is through our work, whether it is through your business, um, whether it's through music or whichever way, whether it's through acting or um, cooking. Whatever gifts and talents and abilities you have, you need to use it for the kingdom. And, uh, yeah, so I just want to uh, uh, stop right there. And, you know, just like they said, this is my book. It's The Original Glory of Man. Um, and I kind of talked a little bit about what's in the book. Um, but there's going to be more written in my next book, which I'm currently working on. Um but, yeah, you can find this on Amazon. And I don't know the names of the bookstores that uh, you guys have over there in the U.K., um, but um, I believe that they're on the uh, the, uh, the, inter the website for uh, those bookstores. Um, yeah. So, um, Laura, I thank you for this time and just allowing us to um, just come together and uh, hear me. Uh, we just give you the glory and honor and I thank you Lord that um, that you speak to that 
uh, you move in everyone's parts and uh, to for you to reveal their I uh, their identity in you, oh God. And uh, yeah, bless this time and bless them and bless the rest of their day. Uh, and uh, give them divine appointments and divine encounters from 